Okay, we're ready to go. Welcome to Directions in Digital Scholarship. I'm Joan Lippincott, Associate Executive Director Emerita of CNI, and I'm assuming you can all see the first slide up on the screen, yes? Because I, I don't see it from here, so just wanted to make sure. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here with you today to talk about this initiative. In 2022, Cliff started to talk to me about where CNI might want to go programmatically in digital scholarship, and he thought it was time to kind of take stock of what was going on in the community. Looking back at where things came from and how they were established, how they related to the institutional mission and priorities, uh, what st sustainability looked like at this point, what current uh, currently is happening with programs as we emerge from the pandemic on campuses and where people think these programs are going in the future. And as we talked, we discussed um, that this really needed to be broader than talking about the term digital scholarship. And so that's why the subheading for this initiative is support for digital, data intensive, and computational research. And I think that's a very important piece of what the program was about. And um, so we began to talk about this last year. And in January of 2023, we actually started the program. We started with interviews online of 12 leaders in the library field or leaders of digital scholarship programs. And these were one hour Zoom interviews. And I had two purposes in mind for these interviews. One was I had created a profile template for institutions to complete because everyone wants to know what's happening, what do these programs actually do? What's their staffing like? Who do they serve? What disciplines do they serve? Those kinds of things. And we had established such a template in the very first workshop we did in 2014. So I updated that and uh, showed it to the interviewees, and they gave me some feedback on that. And for example, they added some components in, in the questions asking about support for infrastructure, technology infrastructure. And we saw, for those of you who are just at the University of Oklahoma presentation in the last session, that that's an, an area that I think is emerging in a small number of institutions in, in terms of the library involvement, but was important to ask. Some also suggested some specific things to add in the instructional activities portion of the profiles. In addition, one of the interviewees um, suggested a question which was, what, what, is, what would you like to happen next in your program? And that was Harriet Hamasi, who's now dean at Georgetown. And that actually elicited some really interesting responses, which I'll get into towards the end of my presentation. So we received a total of 47 profiles. We put out a call for expressions of interest in, intent, in attending two invitational forums on this topic. These would be online forums of two and a half hours each um, via Zoom. It's a long, long time, and we could have gone even longer. Um, they were very lively sessions. And out of those 47, we chose 24 institutions, both representing a variety of types of institutions and programs, but importantly, representing people at different levels of the organization, library deans, associate or assistant university librarians, and people directly involved in working in digital scholarship programs programs. Now, all of the 47 institutions would have been well qualified to attend the two forums. And um, in the data that I'll be uh, discussing in this session and in the report that will come out this spring from this initiative, I've looked at all of these things. The, um, the information I collected in the interviews, the profiles of the 47 in institutions, the responses in the um, invitational forums, all of that uh, is a rich set of information, uh, mostly qualitative, some quantitative, um, that I'll be trying to describe and summarize for you in the report. 
In addition, when I interviewed the 12 interviewees, I gave them a sample list of questions that I thought we would address during the two forums and vetted those, and by and large, they remained uh, relatively unchanged. And uh, I'll get into the responses to some of those questions in a, in a minute. Now we're here at this CNI meeting, and then we have uh, two follow-on webinars that we'll be uh, putting on this sp uh, spring uh, uh, to further um, inform you about this program. Now, when I interviewed people and during the forums, lots and lots of people who are directly involved in digital scholarship said, I don't like the term digital scholarship. And I, I understand that, but no one had a suggestion for a universally or a broadly accepted term that was used to describe this set of activities. And so I've continued to use it. I'm not a proponent of it. I guess I'm a pragmatist, and I think it's what works right now. And so I will, will continue to use it, and in fact, in this presentation and the report, I'm shorthanding digital scholarship, data intensive, and computational research as digital scholarship, or DS, because putting it, saying it all is just such a mouthful each time. So I like this definition um, from the University of Colorado Libraries, and I'm gonna read some of it to you, why I, th I think it's um, a good definition. Digital scholarship extends traditional methods of research by leveraging new technologies and digital data to advance research and enhance pedagogy. While it's commonly associated with digital humanities, computational science, social science, and data science, digital scholarship is applicable to all disciplines, and it often relies on interdisciplinary collaborations. And examples of some of the methodologies are text and data mining, social network analysis, geospatial analysis, data visualization, digital exhibits, and digital project management. Now, there are even more things that we'll be discussing and how people put things under the umbrella of digital scholarship or put them in separate um, buckets or separate units within their library or within their institution is one of the things that I think is um, something that I'll describe more in the report and in this session today. So I'm just going to show you a few of the programs that, were, uh, that participated in the forums just to give you an example of some of the diversity that we find out there. So relatively recently um, at the University of Pennsylvania, they reorganized their staff so that there is a new um, program called Digital Scholarship and Data Services. So they're under one assistant university librarian, which is definitely not the case in a number of other institutions. And some of their projects are, are on the right. All of these have links to their websites and my slides will be online. At McMaster University, you'll see on the left um, some information about the Sherman Center, which is their long-standing and very active digital scholarship center. And on their website for digital scholarship, on the right, they list related services such as 3D printing, research data management, data services, GIS, et cetera. So they have them organized a bit differently. I also don't want you to think that it's only the large research universities that have digital scholarship programs. Some liberal arts colleges have programs and Swarthmore was one of the participants in the forums and so this is their website and the projects that they're highlighting. Some programs have a heavy emphasis on research oriented activities. I'd say all of them do some or perhaps half or more uh, research-oriented activities, but Northeastern has a particularly heavy emphasis with their digital scholarship group. And so in, by the research orientation, what I mean is that they're working as partners or collaborators, usually with a faculty-led project, and often these relationships extend over a period of years to establish uh, the project, to, to develop it, to, um, to, to curate it, uh, all th and perhaps to publish it all through the stages. Um, uh, and here are some of their programs. Now, in addition, 
some of the staff at Northeastern and at other digital scholarship programs do their own research, either the meaning the staff affiliated with the library are doing their own digital scholarship projects or they're developing some tools to use in digital scholarship tools for the community. Some have developed um, more heavily in instructional activities, and I don't mean that this example from University of Oregon means that they're doing more with instruction than with research, but I used this example to show you the types of range of activities. So here they are recruiting for a course assistant for their humanities research data management credit course. And on the right, you'll see they're offering workshops on OER and digital publishing. So some of these programs, for example, include digital publishing as part of their digital scholarship programs. In other libraries or other universities, those programs are either in scholarly communication or a different division of the university or whatever. There is no one organizational model. We asked about um, the relationship of the digital scholarship programs to diversity, equity, and inclusion programs at their institution. We asked this during the two uh, forums. And I would say, I believe every one of the 24 institutions is doing something related to DEI. The most frequent were more partnerships on projects that highlight diverse groups and content. And you'll see, for example, on the right, University of Michigan is giving many grants to work with people on such projects. More exhibits, online digital exhibits highlighting diversity. Outreach to campus groups with diverse populations in order to make those ties and to make sure those groups know that these services and this expertise is available on campus. And a smaller number were hosting events highlighting diversity. One of the main questions that we asked during the forum was how does your program align now and starting from its uh, or, or origins um, with the institutional mission and priorities? Many of you here in this room realize that um, often a digital scholarship program in a library started by a really um, gung-ho faculty member who was very eager to start working in the digital environment, coming to the library and finding someone who was both um, had the skills and had the great interest in partnering with a faculty member on a project and develop that relationship. These things often happen serendipitously and not as part of some um, institutional mission or alignment or some kind of um, you know, five-year plan for the library. But some of these programs are longstanding and now we wanted to understand, are they intentionally aligning with the institutional mission and uh, priorities? And it, it's hard, a little bit hard to pin people down on that sometimes and in the conversations and I would say that my conclusion is that it's variable. However, my observation from the forums, from the people who spoke to this topic in forums, is that those individuals from STEM-oriented institutions had the strongest sense of alignment with the institutional mission. And I'm sure some people would um, disagree with me on that, but that was my observation from the groups we, we um, talked with. I do want to insert at this point, this is not a statistically valid sample either the 47 institutions who put in their profiles or the 24 who participated in the online forums. So this is a sample of, of uh, institutions from the CNI membership and it gives a snapshot, but it's not a statistically valid sample and I'm sure we uh, missed some important trends but I hope we captured, uh, we captured some important trends. And of course, there are changes in institutional priorities over time, and that can be due to a new president, new provost, new head of the Office of Research, new head of the library, um, and new technologies, right? Look what um, ChatGPT is doing to shaking everyone up and, and uh, some of their priorities. 
Another thing that was really um, important for some institutions in terms of institutional alignment was the creation or forging of new partnerships, which often led to an infusion of resources by the institution overall, you know, uh, the institutional budget, or by a specific office, like the Office of Research, uh, or a particular college at the university that might fund a facility, might fund even a staff position, uh, or more than one staff position, or a new center where, um, several units would be co-located, say, to work with a research inten uh, data intensive research. Through the profiles and through the conversations in the forums, we looked at the scope of the programs. Everyone does consultations and instruction. But you'll see in the profiles, and by the way, they are already, the 24 profiles of the institutions who participated in the forums are up on the website. And uh, we have Paige Pope, Paige, would you wave your hand? Thank you. We have Paige Pope, the CNI's communications coordinator, to thank for getting those up in such a timely manner for preparing the profile and helping massage the data from those and from the forums and the polls that we took during the forums, and it was a huge help. Could, I could not have done it myself, literally. Um, and so in the consultation section of the profile, you'll see that we have a wide range of types of consultations, re ranging from consultations on things like project management, intellectual property, um, curation, um, data, uh, management plans, all kinds of, of things. Um, in instruction, we asked about workshops and of various types, course-related classes, credit courses, um, and we have all of that data available for you uh, in those um, profiles that are on the web. In terms of uh, generalizing, I would say everyone's doing consultations and instruction, and in a wide variety of areas. Similarly, everyone's constituency includes faculty, graduate students, if they have them, undergraduates, and often community members. And almost everyone serves all disciplines. So I think there, there's often a misconception that these are uh, uniquely digital humanities oriented and uh, I think from the beginning, digital scholarship programs have served a wide variety of disciplines. Now what came up in the forums that was new to me was a representative from one university saying that 50% of the consultations they do came from university administration. And I was unaware of that. And so if I had a prof to do a profile again, I would definitely add that. And she elaborated by saying these were uh, questions um, on GIS, uh, these were questions on, um, uh, from the facilities unit, uh, looking at various types of data across the institution, uh, from the provost and the president's office, so they wanted the expertise of the digital scholarship unit to be able to use tools to get answers from data that had been collected. In terms of changes in the past five years and particularly as we emerge from the pandemic, what, were, what can we say um, that uh, we know about these institutions? Actually, I would say there's less change than one might have anticipated. Everyone is still doing both online and in-person consultations. The online consultations have gone up, but the in-person consultations have remained strong at most institutions. In terms of instruction, it's a little bit different. Everyone's still doing both, but in some institutions, they've some slightly dis decreased the number of, of, of in-person offerings and are doing more with their online um, instructional kinds of offerings. In terms of facilities, everyone felt the facilities are still as important as they were before the pandemic. And so that was also an interesting finding. 
We asked, um, we did not ask any detailed questions about funding. What we wanted to know more, mo these programs are funded from library budgets, and we've known that from, you know, for the past 10 years or more, and that's the type of programs that we're focused on um, in this initiative. But most, right, like a great uh, majority of programs are supplemented by external and or internal funding. So external by federal agencies like NEH and NIH, or private funders like the Mellon Foundation, and internal funding, thing, funds from the provost's office, from the research office, from research computing, uh, and other programs, less so from the Center for Teaching and Learning and Diversity and Equity and Inclusion programs. But it was quite common to have some funding from other sources. And all of them have some physical facilities. So the question that interests me most um, about this initiative is to try to understand the current state and where we're going in the future in the relationship of what we've known as digital scholarship, which is in itself hard to pin down, and data intensive and computational research activities. For, for example, where do you draw the line? There's a lot of uh, digital scholarship that's data intensive, right? So. Um, I, d I don't want to draw that line, and I don't know um, if someone will. But we put all of these together and asked people about the relationship of these uh, services. And I do use the word services advisedly. I know that's another word a lot of people don't like. But what I would say is most people want to use partnerships and collaborations instead. And I would say that while some services or some activities, let's use the word activities, are in fact collaborations and partnerships. Other things are not, like a one-off workshop is not generally a collaboration, and it's an instructional activity. So maybe services isn't the right word, but I, I um, given my age, I still use it. So what I concluded from the responses to this question during the, um, during the forums is that people said that they believe there is increasing overlap. And if you attended this session from the University of Oklahoma, which was in this room in the last session, you heard them saying they started out with meteorology, next stop is digital humanities, because the same tools are being used. And this is what I'm trying to get at. What are libraries doing about this in terms of the skill sets, the staffing models, the units they're establishing and trying to understand that better? And in the forums, they said, but there's less overlap when high-end research computing is involved. And that was tr uh, true in the answers in the templates. For example, in terms of the infrastructure section, that's where people had the fewest responses saying, yes, they did some of these technology infrastructure activities. However, we see that at Oklahoma, I think it's out front in where um, some libraries may be going in providing these high-end um, computing environments. And some of them clarified, some of the participants said, except in initial consultations, that many faculty feel comfortable in coming to someone associated with a library and talking over their project and not being embarrassed that they don't know um, every coding um, in, in and out of Python or what they should be doing about this particular aspect, uh, technical aspect of their project. But they do feel comfortable starting out with someone in the library who can then refer them on, uh, give them some information to get started and refer them on. And then I found that very few have all of these areas, areas under one organizational unit. In terms of new approaches, some are already reorganizing library functions and staff so that these are under one associate university librarian or one assistant librarian. I'd say it's a small number at this point, and most of them are recent, and it will be interesting to see if others follow. 
Some use a concierge model, and at the December CNI meeting, NC State uh, gave a great presentation on that model of having an individual or a, pr a group of individuals who are the starting point and then refer on to the specialized areas. But pretty much everyone agreed that we need improved communication to constituencies so they do know what's available, where the expertise is, where to go, how to access, and what, they're, what is available in terms of level of uh, provision of service or partnership. When we asked about physical facilities, pretty much everyone had some training and classroom spaces, consultation spaces, spaces for collaborative projects, and many had computer or data labs. Least frequent were AI labs, data science labs, or visualization spaces, although many indicated that they had those spaces on campus, but not in the library. Many mentioned the key partnerships. I've already talked about um, all of these, um, with the exception, perhaps, I didn't mention a museum uh, partnership, a publishing program that wasn't part of the library or part of the Digital Scholarship Unit, the Office of Student Affairs and the Teaching and Learning Center. All of those were important. Sustainability is a tricky area, and we asked about that. So some of the things that promote sustainability, it was very interesting um, to hear the way that they framed this issue. They didn't say, we need money. They said, we need strong administrative and faculty support because that's what will get us the resources. If people understand and support what we're doing and believe that it's an important contribution to the university's research and instructional programs, they will provide more support. And that either pre is preceded by or leads to an uptake in, of digital scholarship practices by faculty. Another thing contributing to sustainability is participation in the program by staff from many units. By that, I would say people from an instructional unit in the library, from metadata, from uh, special collections, uh, the subject specialists, et cetera. If it isn't, usually digital scholarship units are quite small in their staffing, and in order for them to scale up their programs, and, and they need the expertise uh, drawn from these other units. And then clear guidelines, both for projects and for levels of service, are very important, so that they have um, ways of accepting or saying, no, we can't really help you with that, or we can help you up to this point. Uh, and what impedes sustainability, lack of general understanding of the program, and that includes within the library itself by other staff members in the library, but also on campus by faculty and administrators, gaps in staffing, either the, literally the bodies because there's so much turnover, the affordability of staff and the expertise, and of course the expertise needed changes over time, and then the lack of formal agreements. So a number of people said that one of their biggest problems was that, you know, five, even ten years ago, someone started working with a faculty member group on a digital scholarship project, and they're still working with that pro project now. And there's no end in sight, there's no formal agreement that says, we're going to stop at this point and, and archive it or not archive it or how they're going to end that involvement. And priorities change. There may be some activities that should be taking more staff time than what was done five or 10 years ago and they're not sure how to get out of that. So that is one of the things that impedes. I, I'm getting a lot of uh, positive nods on that one. <laughs> In terms of what's next for programs, many put like three or more things, so they're very ambitious, which is great. Some of these things are their dreams. Others are things they are just starting, the realities. They're actually starting these things. So some of the more frequent were creating AR and VR spaces and services, establishing data visualization facilities, more computational and data services, and expanding digital publishing. 
A fewer number said more intensive instructional programs and strengthening campus partnerships. And importantly, several said provide a more unified, holistic approach, which is what I think this is about in terms of digital scholarship, data intensive, and computational research. We need to have understandable programs for our communities. So some of the things that we didn't directly address came out here and there were organizational structure, communication, and assessment. I'm just going to go into these very briefly. So with organizational structure, I think some of the questions that we need to understand better, what is included in a digital scholarship program? Some people include maker spaces, for example. Some people call, uh, include media services or publishing services or intellectual property and copyright uh, advice. Others don't and have those separate. Is there a logic or is this just pure history and institutional history and circumstance? How are digital scholarship programs and data intensive computational programs administered? Is there someone in the organization who has oversight to see where those synergies are, where the staff expertise can be shared, and to make decisions to say, we need to you know, be more flexible in how staff are, um, are used across the organization? and how is the library represented in discussions at the university level, particularly in data intensive oriented discussions which are taking place on almost every campus. In communication, I think there's more and better communication needed internally to library staff so that they'll become more excited and interested in participating, particularly to subject liaisons, and then to supervisors of these staff so that they will put in their job descriptions and in their performance reviews that they're going to be valued for participating in digital scholarship activities to external audiences by external to the library, to potential users and partners, so mostly faculty, maybe graduate students and others, uh, to the university administration for sure, um, need solid backing to get those resources, and then to make the case to, to know how to make that case to funders. For assessment, um, one size does not fit all, and so you need to understand the user needs on your community, understand what's being done by other organizations, and understand what you could commit to given the expertise of your staff. And another question that we didn't ask but would be very interesting to hear the responses to is, could they articulate what is success? Okay. Is it related to the institution's goals and strategic plan? Um, how do they express it in quantitative and qualitative data? And how and to whom would they communicate assessment results? So that's um, what I wanted to summarize, and much more detail will be in the report that will come out pretty soon. We're also going to have a follow-on seminar on April, a uh, webinar on April 20th. This will be a one-hour program with three institutions, and I pick different um, institutions with different programs, but also I wanted someone at the dean level, at the AUL level, and someone who directly works with um, digital scholarship. So I hope that will be very interesting. It has not been announced on CNI Announce. Probably next week, I would anticipate, we'll put out the announcement and how to, to sign up for it and how to get the... Uh, the um, link for the Zoom site. So that's what I wanted to um, talk about. Before we get to discussion, I would just like to acknowledge all of the interviewees and forum participants, whether you directly participated or if you know someone from your institution uh, did. Could you raise your hand if you were one of the participants or um, it's great to see you. I have really bright lights in my face, so it's a little hard for me to see uh, everyone, but thank you so much. Um, we wouldn't have all of this information without you. So I wanted to ask you, if you don't mind, and then if you prefer, we can turn to your questions. 
who would like to address um, the question at your institution, what are the connections and disconnects among programs or units supporting digital scholarship, data intensive, and computational research? And if you'd like to say, how would you make changes? Anybody game to answer that? There's some microphones, or there's a microphone there. Um, I, if you're at the back of the room, it's really it will be hard for me to hear unless you have a really loud voice if you want to uh, say. Is anyone willing to uh, volunteer an answer to that? If not, we'll move to your questions. And I'll be very disappointed if there are no, no questions from you. Pascal. Hi, uh, Pascal Calarco. I'm at the University of Windsor. Um, we're a very small library. We have 68 librarians and staff total. And we have uh, an academic data center, uh, which is connected to our statistical uh, Canada um, unit that provides access to census microdata, that kind of thing. Um, they do programming in Stata, um, SPSS, um, they have a PhD who works in there who will advise on methodology. <clears throat> then we have, um, I, I'm in um, scholarly communications, which is totally separate, <laughs> and I do institutional repository, um, OJS, um, monographic publishing, um, working with those folks on uh, things like funder data deposit um, compliance, um, this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and then we have um, a very long um, newspaper digitization program which has started to look at how do we use this corpus of data for um, answering questions. And they're kind of all in, th in three different areas. And we do have a Center for Digital Scholarship, um, which has more people involved who are usually on the humanities side. <clears throat> I, I think all of these things could certainly work in tandem. Um, we do work together um, informally, but I think we could do so much more if um, we actually had explicit kind of strategic alignments and, and maybe being organized in a more formal way. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Hi. Hi. So uh, I'm Andrea Kosovic, York University, Toronto, Canada. So I don't know if this is happening in the States, but this has hit the, the AUL AD list, listserv that Amazon Web Services are targeting a number of different faculty, a number of different departments. Okay, I don't see anybody nodding their heads. So it looks like a Canadian campaign, but they're exploiting exactly what you have on that slide, right? So they are trying to divide university and trying to insert themselves, how can I say this more politically, trying to manufacture a need um, that, per, that is already perhaps being met uh -huh. um, by a particular area um, and generating pressure on these different groups that may not be already be in conversation with each other. So I haven't heard about that happening at our institution but I can definitely share that that is definitely happening at other institutions. So why, why am I saying this? Well, I, 
I really see the linkage between these three areas really happening. You know, what is what what connects all of these areas? It's research data management. Mm -hmm. It forces us all to have these conversations together um, across campus. And I have to say, when you have a shared process where all grants are vetted through the Office mm -hmm. of Research Services and they start to understand what research data management looks like, how it needs to be funded, um, that creates those opportunities for us to be a little bit more closely tied and perhaps, I, I guess, identify within our institutional structures where these different programs might be best funded or supported, but create that sort of uh, connected network so we all can, can work together in, in some form. Thank you. Shumo. Shima Wang from the Northwestern. Um, John, I'm, thank you for this very interesting report. I'm, look at your question, I try to reflect some of my thinking based on the experience I had with the University of Cincinnati, right. now with the Northwestern. So the change I have been observed from these two institutions is about this digital scholarship practices. We are become much more broader. We are go. We went beyond the, the humanities, social science, mm -hmm. and uh, in the Cincinnati, the center we have engaged actually many of the works already in the medical campus, mm -hmm. right? So we are applying uh, applying the NIH grant. So in terms of the sustainability for the future, I'm thinking about particularly recently this freezing phenomenon about generative AI happening in any of the campus. Right. In the Northwestern Provost Office already organized a university-wide of the working group looking at those, those issues. Now in the Northwestern, many school centers already have this computational mm -hmm. initiative going on. By the way, nobody called digital scholarship Right. <laughs> only, right. only library people right. call it digital right. scholarship. Right. So thinking about the future, our model, I'm thinking about particularly operational funding and the staffing mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. It has to be go beyond the library. Right. We right. cannot just yeah. employ library people using library funding or apply library uh, special funding to keep this going for many reasons the impact for that model is very minimal. You constantly run into the challenge to explain what you are doing versus other center, versus other of the initiative doing on the campus. So I'm thinking about in the Northwestern, here is my thinking. I'm still six months new, mm -hmm. so I have the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to create a new practice based on some of, some of the success lessons I learned from Cincinnati then we're going to create this, this time is joint multi-unit from mm -hmm. the IT research office, schools, centers, mm -hmm. operation. I'm not sure we're continually called digital scholarship center. Right. However, I do agree with you. I have no idea what I'm going to call. <laughs> <laughs> right. So those thinking is thinking about in the future, the staffing model I would say largely draw from the teaching research faculty, mm -hmm. IT research computing, mm -hmm. those kind of unit to together to join the library. But how this governance is going to work, mm -hmm. how this is going to flow into the mm -hmm. radar screen in the provost presence mm -hmm. initiative. My, provost, my pro provost already said, Shima, I love your ideas, but the, the questions other people also thinking about similar ideas as well. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to have to talking about this. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are the couple of the reflections. I really appreciate your observations. Thank you, Shuma. Time for one more. Thank you. Thank you. He's taller. Hi, Judith Conklin, Library of Congress. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at your first question and um, you're calling it digital scholarship, and I've, we use interchangeable terms also 
um, you know, what is the right one? I've heard it called digital transformation, digi digital forward I've been using lately. Um, and um, as we talk about it at the Library of Congress, um, it's becoming very apparent to me it's all about the data. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. very much all about the data mm -hmm. and what we do about the data. And so, um, you know, how do you determine that? Through data governance um, throughout the organization, and I don't mean just the library, but at the Library of Congress throughout all of our business units. And so we are working on that, um, a, an agency data management type of governance. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not mature in that right now in um, where we wanna go, but we're having those great conversations. And so governance of the data, do we need a CDO? We don't have a CDO. Do we need a CDO? But I think everything that we're talking about digital is all about the data. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks very much. And you have the last word. Thank you so much for engaging with me in this uh, project. And I hope you'll be reading the report and participating in the webinar in the future. Thank you. Thank you.